this explanation of OMA and how it all started. Uh, I will uh, give you some insight in our current involvement in Asia and will present some of the projects we're doing currently from the Beijing office, which was uh, started in 2002, um, where we worked on CCTV, the project, uh, project Bank of Asia, but all worked on projects in Bangkok and in Singapore, but also in Shenzhen, the city uh, Ram just explained. Uh, also work that we created from Hong Kong, uh, our newest office, office that started in 2009, and that we started to work on three specific projects. Uh, the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, the headquarters of the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, the biggest stock exchange of China in the future because of the free economical zone. The Taipei Performing Arts Center, a project that Ram was going to show at the last project in his presentation, so you didn't see it. Uh, but it's a theater um, that is uh, a project that combines three theaters in one uh, that can create a super theater and therefore a big space where things can happen that in traditional theater can't happen. Uh, that can only happen in Taipei because their uh, Asian theater is more or less brought forward and currently the modern day theater is invented there. And the West Kulun Cultural District project, an urban planning project right in the heart of Hong Kong, one of the most dense cities in the world, uh, where we were asked to create a cultural uh, entity with 14 theaters and the third largest museum in the world. I will go through a few of these projects uh, and will show you uh, how we work and what kind of work we're doing in Asia. First, the Shenzhen Stock Exchange. Uh, a project uh, that is not uh, a project that wants to be special in architectural language, but that wants to be special in its organization. A very generic building in the sense of it's a tower and it's a podium. The only difference between that is that you have a tower, you have a podium, but the podium is lifted up in the air. And because it's lifted up in the air, it creates new possibilities. It creates spaces underneath the podium that can become public spaces, shielded from rain and from sun that is so much there in Shenzhen. And therefore, can create areas in a central business development that uh, can accommodate people and not only companies and money. Also, we utilize the top of the podium, but I will tell that a bit later. So this is uh, the building in its current state. It's under construction. Um, that's also a unique thing about Asia. Uh, projects go from first conceptual planning to be realized uh, almost in a time of four to five years of scales of almost 200,000 square meters. So that's an enormous space. Speed in architecture, and especially in Asia, is extremely important. Here you see the podium. Uh, lifted up in the air, 36 meters, which creates underneath it a grand entrance but also public spaces that are shielded. Um, these public spaces have uh, a possibility on both sides of the city, one where the workers come and one where the rest of the city is. And you see how that is organized with an official entrance with a plaza for uh, the workers and the people uh, coming, uh, working inside the building, and on the other end, a more public, more grand entrance uh, where people can also stay. And here you see another angle shot of how it is in its current state. Also, we utilize the top of this podium as a park, uh, because in every central business district, uh, nature is under pressure. And we think, especially in a climate that is quite harsh, nature is very important. So on top of the podium, we created a park that is uh, open also for the public coming into the building. And you can use that park, which has a very clear, distinct design uh, for the benefit of relaxation within the business. And here you see how all net structures will be there uh, so that you're also there shielded from the sun. Areas where you can really relax while you're doing your business uh, in the city. There's a running track all around and on top. 
For a building like this, we are not only doing the architecture from the outside uh, for the intention of the public space, but we were also asked to do uh, the interiors. You see uh, that we distinguished some different zones. So the entrance zone with the public areas and the public. Then the podium, which holds the dealing room, which is, of course, the heart of the stock exchange. And then also the office spaces and the VIP spaces on top. <coughs> this is the entrance, uh, except an entrance from one side for the work workers and the other uh, side for the public. There are different cores in it. And here you see an image uh, of that interior, a very modern day uh, interior with a lot of uh, modern, sophisticated gadgets, uh, tools in it, but also references to Chinese architecture and also reference to stock market uh, patterns. For example, in the Korean with gold leaf core uh, that marks where you go if you want to go up. And here you see the elevators in the lobby um, going up to the park level uh, and also going up to the dealing room. The dealing room itself is the heart of the project, but also is a festive place where new listed companies are celebrated. And in China, uh, that is done with a ceremony uh, with also a bell, where when you are listed, uh, the gong uh, sounds. And from that moment on, you can deal in that company. And here you see in its current state how that is going to be built. For it, we also designed uh, a desk. Uh, desk. Um, normally, people that are dealing in a stock exchange have about eight screens in front of them, them and therefore don't see anything what is beyond the screens. No people, not their colleagues. Uh, and what we designed is a desk where these screens are more lowered and people can still have contact with their colleagues, which is very needed because sometimes a tenth of a second is a difference of millions and also with their supervisors, so that they can do the right business. Museum for where artifacts are stored of all the listed companies, but also simple office interiors for the workers that have to do all the administration, combined with atriums so that they have access to nature at all times. And VIP spaces in China, very important, the VIP dining space where the real deals are made. Here you see the building in its current situation, photo taken one week ago. And you see that the facade currently is applied to the building, a facade that we have been designing from the beginning as a glass facade in front of the concrete. And you should be able to see both. Uh, the glass, when it's lit, uh, when it's lit by sunlight becomes opaque, but when sunlight comes from a different angle, it becomes completely transparent and you see the skeleton of the building, the concrete skeleton. We have been testing that very carefully, so first with mock-ups, but also mock-ups in real scale to understand how we should do it. And this is how you see it now applied, uh, different sides, so you see immediately the difference in opaqueness uh, when the su uh, sun hits it. Here it's much more opaque than there. An image from height and an image at night lighting in, in between the concrete and the glass making it a glowing object. This is when the sun hits it, completely reflective. And here you see it from another angle becoming much more opaque and less dominant. Another project I wanted to show you is the Chuhai College. It's a university project uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, again, a public building uh, on a very important site in the city, where we were asked to create a school that is dedicated to Chinese history, uh, but within Hong Kong context, so they can really discuss all Chinese history, also recent history, uh, that is uh, focused on international relationships and that has cross-disciplinary uh, schooling. In a site that has beautiful views and unbelievable good feng shui, uh, sea view, uh, mountain view at the back, uh, city view and the view to the Gold Coast, um, 
all elements that we wanted to have benefit from for the building itself. It was located on an old army uh, base, British army base, that was after the handover uh, left, and where now uh, new public buildings can be uh, erected in the city. And as you probably know, Hong Kong is a very dense city. 30% of it is uh, dense built. But what most people don't know is that Hong Kong is for 70% uh, nature. And what we wanted to do on this uh, site was to create the same balance uh, within a university building. So this was what we were asked to do, to build a campus building uh, on this plot, uh, two stories high, which would mean that the program would occupy 64% of the site and almost no nature was left, only 36%. And we said maybe we can investigate how far we can go and how much more compact but also how much more functional we can make it. So for example, if we went to six stories, you would still have 22% of built and 78% of green. And we, in the end, we decided to keep, go even more extreme to eight stories, only 16% built and 84% uh, unbuilt in nature. But when we did this, we saw that there was no heart, no kind of special entity within the building. So we took it as an apple, sliced it in two pieces, and pushed them away and created a heart in between, which would be part of the whole complex and could be the, the gathering point in the campus. So we studied all kinds of classical compass models, spread out in small buildings, went to the extreme, but in the end we decided to go for a, complex, uh, a very compact volume, cut it in between and create a heart in the middle where all the interdisciplinary facilities could be located. This was our first sketch model for the competition, and this was our first diagram. I need to mention one more thing. Next to the building there is a hill, a hill full of green trees, beautiful, uh, and we wanted to have interaction with that hill and the building as well. By creating the building as we did and pushing it towards the hill with the heart in the middle, we were able to create an artificial hill in the middle and then build the real existing hill on the side. By creating holes in the building, we could change from the artificial to the real hill. Also, sustainability is an important part of our responsibilities as architects at the moment. Uh, so we put the building in the direction of the wind, especially in the months where it's very warm and humid in Hong Kong. And by tunneling the wind through the building, we were able to bring down the air conditioning load by almost 40%, simply by smart, smart positioning of the massing. And you see that therefore the facade sometimes is closed and sometimes is open. Also shading was very important. Uh, we positioned the building in such a way that it would shade its heart itself. So the map in between is shaded by the building itself. And here you see then how a very compact building with its own heart at the seafront uh, becomes visible. In the slabs, uh, we have all the classrooms and all the educational facilities and in the artificial hill in the middle we have all the lecture halls, gymnasiums, libraries, cafeterias, etc, etc. Um, we use a bi-steel facade, which is a new product, uh, two steel sheets filled with concrete, which can have a lot of tension and uh, because of that you can create a lot of opening. This facade is almost 55% open uh, and the large holes are not uh, uh, supported by any other structure than this uh, bi steel facade itself. It's the very first time it's used in Asia. And uh, by doing so, we were able to create slabs of 14 meters without any columns, in which, by no accident, you can create all the educational facilities in a flexible setup. So, lecture rooms, classrooms, studios, but also offices uh, can be created in that same space. As I said, with the bi steel, you can also create enormous large holes, which uh, make sure that the transport between the artificial hill and the real hill can take place, like in this sketch. And 
In these halls, we put very public facilities, like a great hall uh, where uh, you can have uh, festivals, a cafe, and a central meeting point for the students. Underneath the map, we have libraries, uh, the treasure room. This school is very famous for school Chinese books, gymnasiums. Um, here you see the treasure room. Here the library. Cafeteria, and then the sports facilities. And on top of the sport facilities, the lecture halls. Then on top of that, the mat itself, a public outdoor domain with a swimming pool and kind of all kinds of possibilities of outdoor use. For example, for graduation ceremonies, but also in an everyday setting for people just to gather and relax, have their lunch outside in the harsh climate of Hong Kong with a wind that is tunneled with sun that is shielded by the buildings itself. The building has many layers. Um, as I said already, the bi steel facade, uh, the boxes that are flexible in shape and space because of the big span, a grid uh, with all the circulation attached to it, and then just a simple metal mesh to shield people from folding down. And if you then look carefully, a very simple con the concept of two slabs with a heart becomes very layered and very complex and creates an ideal environment for uh, interactive education, as you can say. Groundbreaking was on May 12th uh, of this year. Uh, the building will be ready in end of 2013. The West Coulomb Coastal District, uh, I mentioned it already. We were asked, uh, in the middle of Hong Kong, there's one place, one void, um, that is on Victoria Harbor, that is not planned yet. Very difficult to uh, access. Uh, it's, it's very badly located uh, compared to the major infrastructure. And we were asked to plan there uh, an enormous amount of program. But the nice thing was that we were able to do that uh, for a year long, alongside two other architects, uh, Norman Foster, and Rocco Design, uh, an architectural firm from Hong Kong. And actually we were asked to make uh, the best conceptual plan, but you can imagine that it becomes almost a beauty contest, um, and that not only best, but also beauty that becomes an issue. Um, the program that we were asked to make, as I said, 14 theaters, not many distinct uh, um, nature, a big museum, the third largest museum uh, in the world. One little detail, there was no collection. Uh, so what would be in there? Other cultural facilities and a lot of commercial facilities, office, hotel, housing and retail. Uh, we all know Hong Kong uh, as a very vibrant uh, place. If you have been there, uh, you see it as a very busy city. But as said, uh, Hong Kong is uh, mainly this, a lot of nature and even some very old historical settlements which are very important for the character of the city because there is where people get their rest when they don't work. Um, we thought culture uh, needs to have both elements because it needs to represent all elements of the city. So we decided first to make one plane of nature, uh, the whole site, and then on top of that make settlements uh, that have the program. In this case, three settlements one uh, that was dedicated to the visual arts, one that was dedicated to performing arts, and one that was dedicated to all the commercial facilities, but also was representing uh, Hong Kong in its best way, in its dance way, um, and its uh, merchant's way. And here you see a model uh, that we created for uh, the project, where you clearly see a lot of nature all around, and then the three settlements within. By doing so, we wanted to create a utopia right in the heart of the city uh, that could uh, be a place of rest, but also a place where culture not only could be uh, seen, but also could be produced, because that was one of the things that we thought was very important. When we looked at the program, actually it was all about passive consumption of culture. But art is not uh, passive consumption. Uh, art is mainly work, uh, and very exciting work. 
And how can you show uh, that art is a career, an artist's work, within a city where actually art almost doesn't exist, or creative industries almost don't exist, because finance is the main uh, spirit of the city. So we said you don't only need facilities where you can look at art, but you also need a lot of facilities where you can educate art and where you can also work on art. So we took the liberty to change the program. Um, when we did that, we first thought we would be disqualified immediately. Luckily, we were. Um, but in the end, maybe um, following the program uh, would have been more smart. But that is not how we think, and also not what we think our responsibility as architects and as critical thinkers is. So we injected archives, educational facilities, art factories for visual arts, but also um, for performing arts, and also a flexible space, simply space that artists could inhabit and do their own things with. First, Art in the East, which was more or less a three-dimensional settlement, a very difficult structure, where uh, all kinds of layers of art, uh, and then mainly visual arts would be there, an exhibition center where art could be traded at the bottom, then a public foyer where things come together. On top of that, the museum. And on top of that, an art factory with production facilities and even artist housing and hotels. So this would be almost an incubator for art, a place where art can be exhibited, produced, and even be exchanged in the market. And therefore, can have all kinds of arts within. Then on the waterfront, or in the east, uh, we would do the performing arts, uh, where we created a big theater form, a shape where four major theaters would be connected to each other with their backstages. And therefore, different forms of performing arts could start working together. For example, music and street theater, or grand uh, drama with a concert hall. Uh, by doing so, we thought that we could save building 14 theaters, but instead building a few major ones uh, that can be combined. And here you see how it would work. They would be connected uh, with their production facilities and their back of houses, and the public would enjoy that connection as a public connection or a public deck, where they could look at the sunset, which are beautiful uh, in that place. Here an image of the Grand Theater, almost a theater where you can sink into. And then in the middle, a commercial facility, uh, or a space that is more representing Hong Kong. Uh, as its backdrop, it has Elements. Elements is the biggest shopping mall and the most modern shopping mall of Hong Kong, uh, which is almost about 300 meters high, and we could only build 100 meters high. So we decided to even go lower, uh, so that we could simply use this gigantic structure as our backdrop. Uh, no, not trying to compete with it, but just as a backdrop. And then typical Chinese uh, art forms like the Situ School, but also film, which is very big in Hong Kong on each edge. Here you see the Situ Theater that we designed on the water. You could go there with water taxi. Street markets, very important in the economy of the city. And then the film theater, as said, uh, Hong Kong has a very important film industry. And this uh, would then, from uh, far away, uh, be our West Kulung Cultural District. Not per se very grand, uh, but very precise, and uh, trying to really reflect culture in Hong Kong. Unfortunately, we lost uh, the beauty contest. Uh, Norman Foster won. Uh, with the slogan, more than 5,000 trees in the middle of Hong Kong. <laughs> and I think because of the time, that is where I stop. Thank you.